I did have a lot of people in my corner, so to speak, that once I started telling my truth, telling my story, really were very supportive in saying, you know, you're who you are made to be. There's nothing wrong with this, but that people are going to have an issue with it, not because of who you are, but because of where you are. It's just Southern Alberta. Hey fellow workers, my name is Kim Seaver. Welcome back to episode eight of season two for the Alberta Worker Podcast. The Alberta Worker Podcast is a proud member of the Labor Radio Network and new this season, the Harbinger Media Network. We're broadcasting from the territory of the Nitsapi, and I am pleased to announce today's guest is Lindsay jorgensen Skakum. Welcome, Lindsay. Glad to be here with you all today. We'll go straight into telling us your life story, you know, just where you grew up, what your family life was like, uh, where you went to school, that sort of thing, and then as well, tell us your personal labor history, your first job, subsequent jobs, what you're doing now, your journey to get there, that sort of thing. And you can either intermingle them or do them separately. And we'll just go to that point. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kim. Uh, My name is Lindsay Jorgensen Skakum, as Kim said, and I'm really glad to be joining this podcast. I'm now living in Edmonton, but growing up, I grew up on uh, Treaty 7 territory down in Lethbridge. And so a lot of my family is still living down there. I grew up with my mom and dad, a younger sister on the north side of of Lethbridge, going through all the public school system and landing at the University of Lethbridge. And really kind of started off looking for, for work when I was in junior high, high school. One of my friends had a job working at the baseball stadium, flipping hot dogs. And I thought, you know, my friend has a car. This sounds like a great first job. And I remember one of the interview questions was the cliche, you know, like if you were an animal, what animal would you be? And I said lion because I just loved lions. There was no on the job training. It was really an unsafe job at the time. I, I, I'm i sure the person who managed back then is no longer there. But, uh, you know, I wasn't allowed to work the deep fire because I didn't have training, but they let me loose on the barbecue. So I never really <laughs> knew why one was allowed and not the other. But I spent my summer. Uh, Open flame self- was fine, but not hot oil. I'm apparently thankful for that. This meant I got to flip hot dogs and burn all the hot dogs basically all summer for everyone who wanted some at the baseball stadium. That That's at the Henderson Stadium? Yeah, yeah, that would have been back in the, the early 2000s. And, uh, you know, it was my first real lesson also in checking your wages. Uh, my friend's mom was a, a banker and so kind of recognized, actually, we were getting stiffed on our wages a bit. One of our managers wasn't paying us as they were supposed to. And without... That mom kind of looking out for us, we would have just been happily collecting whatever money they gave us and carrying on with our teenage lives. We were able to say like, hey, we're actually missing some money here. And they kind of acted like, oh, weird. (laughs) But I think it was something they'd been doing for a while. Was your hourly wage not as where it's supposed to be or they weren't paying you for certain hours? They weren't paying us for certain hours. So it was back, it was the good old 590. What a time. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, the pennies add up, but luckily, you know, that that experience led me to look more closely at my pay stubs and what I was being paid for and keeping track of hours. And so as much as it was a, Uh, a sad lesson to learn. It was a good one to learn early on with the help of my friend's mom, who was a banker and just saying, make sure you're always checking (laughs) that the people are paying you for your labor. You know, as much as I would probably just say, oh, whatever, you know, the fact that my friend and my friend's mom were there really helped uh, with that. Yeah. And when you're a teenager, you know, like 200 bucks is a good chunk of money. And so you don't think, oh yeah, it'd be great if I had 300 bucks or whatever it happens to be, right? A couple hundred bucks is still a lot of money. And so you think, oh yeah, this is great, whatever. Yeah. So that was, that was a good lesson. And, and also just, you know, a lesson in what do I want to be doing to make money? Is this how I want to be spending my time? I, I didn't go back to that. I I kind of stopped working while I was in high school. It was a lot to take on. I was into sports. I played basketball, coached basketball for many years after that. Where did you go to high school? At uh, Winston Churchill. Okay. So on the other side there of, of Lethbridge and, and had a really great experience there. My parents and my grandparents both were supportive of extracurricular activities, knowing that I'm going to be working for the rest of my life. You know, go be in band, play alto sax, play basketball, be with your friends. My grandparents always gave us a little bit of an allowance every month to kind of say, hey, here, have some gas money. Um, so with the understanding that, you know, for my parents, academics was important, that we're doing things, having life experiences, going on trips. Uh, 
uh, with school groups was important too. So I didn't have that same pressure that some people and families have where they have to find a way to, to meet all those needs. So luckily, um, you know, my family was able to provide for me to, to be in band and to go on trips and to explore the world I was in, uh, whether it was through sports or music. So I really appreciated that. But when it came to it, university days, I did need a job again. <laughs> I did get some scholarships, which are lovely, but uh, university is costly. So I, I lucked out and, and kind of along the lines of what many people say, it's who you know, not what you know. I knew one of the librarians working at the U of L, And so they said, you know, we're looking for some students to help make sure that the books are in order, checking in books when they came. So that was my second, I would say, more real job that I, I came across was working in the curriculum library, which is the education library. So it's kind of like a smaller library within the main U of L library. So it was insulated, it was working with a lot of school textbooks, a lot of student teachers, and really it was a lovely job just to zone out. You could listen to music while you made sure the books were in order and checking them in. I wasn't really there to do anything other than that. So my hours were basically spent returning books and putting books back on the shelf, which was a nice meditative way in between classes just to, to come down and calm down from whatever it was I was trying to study. So that worked out extremely well for, for me. It was a steady job job. It was fairly good pay that it was university. They had really great, as, as far as I was concerned as a student back then, at least procedures and, and helpful ways in the workplace. So one of the wonderful mysteries of the U of L is that all their security is on the main floor. It may have changed since then at the U of L library. So that if you're working by yourself, there was cameras, there was ways that, you know, you could alert others, but on the second floor, there was nothing. So they did have all these extra procedures and you'd wear a walkie talkie and you'd check in with downstairs, which was far more than I ever had at any other job of just awareness of, you know, you are alone. So what does that mean? And, you know, how do you feel safe working alone in an environment as much as an, a library can be safe, but just recognizing not all spaces can be safe all the time. So I appreciated that. And I had a feisty boss who enjoyed doing almost MMA on the weekends. <laughs> <laughs> On the side, she would also teach all of us, you know, just a few things as far as personal safety. And if anyone ever came at you like this, you could do this and this and this. And I never had to use any of those things. But I think of her every once in a while when I'm crossing a dark parking lot. But it was a, a good job. Uh, as far as that goes, never had any any worries other than inter-office politics, which happens in any any space when you have people working closely together. And it's it's it was just a matter of as a student saying, not for me. I'm not a lifetime person here. I don't have to worry about it. I'm just here to put the books back on the shelf. Did you do that every year that you were in school? Um, I did it for my first uh, two and a half years. So when I started at the U of L. I uh, was dreaming of becoming a, a bio teacher at high school level. So a lot of my courses were in the sciences. And um, I did love science. I loved biology, but I was terrible at math. And what I didn't realize is that once you get to university level, most of the science is math, even biology. So um, I got to about a third year level and quickly realized like, this is not for me as much as I'd love to teach high school biology. It just wasn't working out. And I did my first education course that went really well. And at that point, you weren't allowed to work for the library while you were using that same library. So my uh, okay. came to an end, which makes sense. I get it. And through my connections, I ended up getting another job at U of L, working as a, a building maintenance operator. So I spent a summer uh, slugging boxes. They were using, they were moving almost the entire U hall eighth level, which is kind of a long level of, of people. They were shuffling around in the fifth level. They were shuffling some people around. So I spent the summer uh, loading boxes, installing bookshelves, uh, <laughs> learning about wall anchors and wearing safety boots. And it worked out really well. I, I had some trepidation of moving from an office environment to kind of more the workers world underground, so to speak, which at the U of L, you know, the maintenance workers have kind of the lower levels. When was this? Um, so that would have been 2007, eight, I think. Okay. Cause I was still working there. I think I might have seen you. Did you do any painting? Yes, I did that a little bit later. So at first I was like just a regular grunt kind of worker putting in lights. And then they had a paint team that painted basically whatever classrooms needed, walls needed to be fixed throughout the summer. So after a year of kind of proving I was a dedicated worker, they had some issues with people moving boxes who wouldn't show up to work every day or would decide they'd made enough money for the summer and just leave. Being one of the last people standing, they said, hey, we have this job that goes through it the year. Would you want to stay on as a painter? 
change for as long as you're a student, um, you're classified and you're able to work as a building maintenance worker under this student designation that they have. So um, they invited me on the painting team. So I joined that. So it was signs and paint. And there was usually one or two of us throughout the year that worked under a master uh, painter, Red Seal, and um, sign maker. Throughout the summer, then that team kind of grew to, to four to five, depending on what the money was there to hire. So I started as basically as like, well, I've painted once to learning how to, you know, fix wonderful holes students left in the walls, whether it's through anger management after a test or or whatever it was, you know, how to fix walls and how to uh, do drywall and, and painting lots of lovely things. So that was kind of what I spent probably the last five years while I was at the U of L. I was a uh, very long track of my BA, just taking a few courses a year. Right. Yeah. I think I remember seeing you as a painter. Yeah. So I was there from 2001 to 2010. Yeah. And we did do some moving um, from our office. I was with the faculty of management. So we were in, our offices were in the fifth level of U-Haul. Oh no, fourth level of U-Haul. And then we moved up to the fifth level of U-Haul after math and sciences had moved. But yeah, and I, now that you mentioned it, I mean, I do remember seeing somebody who resembles you. I mean, I don't, I can't see the person clearly, but you know, they were tall and short hair and all that kind of stuff. I remember the work boots you're talking about. So yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if maybe that was you. So that's kind of cool. Huh. It probably was. I was like the queer fixture on like the campus <laughs> as far as that goes. Like, <laughs> so uh, lots of people were actually quite surprised because I think just where I was at my bio degree, I think a lot of professors just thought I dropped out and I joined building maintenance and that was my life. They didn't know I'd switched over <laughs> to religious studies and like never darkened the door of a science class again. Bless them. They worked hard to try to get me through in the biologies, but that just wasn't in cards for me. So when I did graduate, there was some really surprised faces <laughs> across the stage, I think, because, you know, I'd been there. I'd been doing lots of behind the scenes work that, you know, a lot of the academics are very supportive of people in building maintenance or, or part of that union. So I think for them, it was a surprise of like, oh, you're still a student. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> I guess you're not going to be here for forever. But I did really enjoy that work environment. It was pretty good. The only thing I ran into was actually some um, homophobia within the workplace. And the U of L is one of the better spaces, I would say, when it comes to having contractors come on site that they really do a, a good job of naming like this is not just a construction site where you can swear you can say whatever you want like this is a place where people are doing learning they're working they're living their lives but it was actually some of the other long-term workers at U of L, whether it was electricians or other tradespeople, that really started saying some homophobic things to one another while I was in the room not I don't think recognizing I was in the room but just the way they were talking and so that was something I did have to deal with eventually and just kind of saying to my boss who was luckily for me a safe person to kind of say this isn't okay like I need you to go and talk with <laughs> like the electricians the plumbers and like let them know they can say they're frustrated with their work but that doesn't have to mean using slurs that are my identity especially while I'm in the room <laughs> like that right. was just nice you know it did change like I could tell that they were talked to and I think it was mentioned that like I mentioned this the guys never came over and said anything like oh we're sorry but there was just that understanding of okay we'll try not to say those things while you're around which at the time was enough for me. I, it wasn't my forever job. It was my, I need to get through school. It's a well-paying job. So I enjoyed that. And as a part of the job, there was lots of great perks like safety training every year. Woohoo. First aid training, which actually <laughs> there's a few times where, you know, I thought I might need this um, while working on the job. It was nice to know that, you know, we had regular hearing testing, like all the things that you would hope for if you're in a loud environment or you're doing the work. So it was kind of neat to see, you know, working in a trades environment that really took safety to that next level. Whereas if someone saw us doing something unsafe, it wasn't just a, a word from our boss. It was usually you got a visit from the safety management team saying, you know, what are you doing? How can we make your job easier? What needs to go on? Why are you doing this rather than that? We were working on ladders a lot. So there was a lot of, you know, make sure you're not reaching too far. Make sure you're not doing these things. Uh, lessons that I take into my life today, even though I'm no longer painting for that many hours a day, it's still the stuff I have the back of my mind. That kept me right through to the end of my uh, U L career, so to speak. I was there long-term similar to you, Kim. Really enjoyed my <laughs> time. But by the time I was done, I did end up with uh, an arts degree 
degree uh, majoring in religious studies, which was kind of part of my transition. I had in the midst of my education 2500 course, which was like the intro to being a teacher, like, is this for you? And they did some basic minimal training on what teachers do and then sent you out into the world somewhere for a placement. And I was at a Catholic school and I was teaching grade six math. And that was just not for me. <laughs> I know that kids can tell when your heart isn't in it. And I think these kids are just like, no, this is not something you enjoy doing. As much as I enjoy being with kids, love kids, um, teaching the math was just not something I wanted to do. They could tell how you felt about math. Yeah, they could tell how I felt about math. So at recess, one of my friends had the kindergartners. And so I got to hang out with their kids and my kids because they'd come over and talk with us as being the student teachers. And one time there was a, a caterpillar who had died that the kindergartners brought over and they were so sad and they were just beside themselves crying and what should we do? And it was a Catholic school. So I took some liberties and I said, well, let's do a funeral. And that was far more meaningful than doing any math or any teaching. And so I kind of said, you know, maybe there's something else to this teaching thing I thought I was supposed to do along the lines of becoming a pastor. Um, so that's more the route I ended up following from then on in my university career. So switching to religious studies. So up to that point, had you got an education degree? No, I hadn't. Had, so it, okay. it's like a double degree. So it would be, right. uh, I was working on my bio degree and then was going to be starting the education degree. Okay. Switched out of both of those and said, see you later and switched over to religious studies. But you had done some PS work. Yeah, yeah, some, yeah. Was this like PS1? Uh, no, just Ed 2500. So kind of oh, okay. the basic beginning point of that. I see. Okay, so then you, you were doing bio, you were about to start your Ed, and that's when you had the revelation <laughs> to go yeah. into religious studies instead. Yeah, so I acknowledge that, you know, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy all different age groups, but it was more the connections that were important to me. Looking at that, I then decided, well, uh, after talking to a few pastors in my life, and I'd had that affirmed for me in other areas of this is something you could do. Have you thought about it? And my thought was always, no, I want to do this biology teacher thing. Um, it wasn't something new that was out of the blue. It was more just like, I could actually do this for my life and it would be pretty life giving, I thought. So, but other people had seen that in you that they, they recognized that there was something there. Yeah. So there oh, okay. was there was quite a few stories of that in my my home congregation. I'm, I'm Lutheran. I went to Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd down in Lethbridge. And uh, a lot of people throughout life were kind of like, I know you've thought about this teaching thing, but have you thought about going to seminary to become a pastor? And I kind of said, well, yeah, but no. I, I was one of those people that was running an extra night service, running the youth group, running a Bible study group, doing a lot of things within the church that are similar to pastor's jobs, but just kind of as a, a volunteer lay member of the congregation. So I think Think people said, you know, you're doing this well. Do you want to keep doing it? Do you want to go to school to learn how to do this more? And at the time I said, you know, I, I think I could do it, but I'd rather be with kids. And, and basketball was a big part of my life back then. So it was also like, well, how do I coach basketball teams if I'm a pastor? <laughs> so uh, I just didn't see how worlds could collide or intertwine. I'm glad things worked out the way they did. Uh, I really enjoyed having the biology background I do have. I'm one of those science believing pastors, the big bang, all of that. I have no issue with it. As well as I used a lot of my religious studies degree to study religions outside of my own. I knew that my master's would be dealing with a lot of my own traditions, um, intricacies in Lutheranism and Christianity. So I studied Islam and I studied Hinduism, studied Buddhism, studied Judaism, as much of the different courses that were offered within the religious studies department I tried to take. And then, you know, you want to pad your grades a little bit. So I did take some upper level Christianity courses just to ensure that my grade point average, which was suffering from my biology degree, would be sustained. <laughs> Yeah, that was me in French. I switched degrees too. I started out with French degree and I was so close. I finished with like 3.42. was so close to getting 3.5 and getting distinction. But Oh, wow. Good for you. Yeah. So long story short, that's how I ended up with my uh, my BA and I loved it. Yeah. And then I went off to do my master's and, and kind of in between every summer, I also worked at a basketball camp in Olds, Alberta. It's a stateside organization really looks for elite players that wants to bring up top level coaches because I never played college ball. I wasn't allowed to coach the higher level players. So I usually was stuck with the nine to 13 year old girls or the nine to 13 year old boys, sometimes the, the 14, 15s, but usually not the high school level, which was fine by me. 
you know, those are the kind of jobs that you're there because you love it, that you want to make a difference in kids' lives because the hourly pay was not great when you broke it down because you were sleeping on site. They paid for your food. They paid for where you were staying in residence. Uh... But realizing later on, it was kind of like, well, there are people that are making a lot of money off our backs, um, which is the math I've done later on in life of realizing, well, the founder of this camp has a multi-million dollar home in the U.S. and people in the organization are making some big bucks. And if each kid's paying 300 U.S. to come here for the week and I'm getting paid 300 to coach, <laughs> what does that mean? That's yeah, like college sports players in the U.S. You know, they, they make hardly any money, if anything at all, but the coaches make a killing. Yeah. So there was definitely some some things there it was also like a, a a camp that was just a bait and switch Christian camp that I wouldn't be involved with today but it was very much a high athletic level and then also some faith-based learning alongside it so kids coming in knew that was part of it really as as coaches it was well you're here to coach but you're also here to help kids in life and teach them life skills and morals and etc cetera, etc cetera, which I was able to do to my own degree with you know nine to 13 year olds as much as it's the first time away from home it's mostly just comfort and care and hanging out but that also affirmed for me that that's not really what I want to do for the rest of my life you know I enjoy sports I enjoy playing sports coaching wasn't something at that level or to that degree that I wanted to carry on so you know I had coached the, the high school level with my old high school kind of the decade after I left so that was kind of a nicer way into sports and into coaching and being with young people in their lives and just enjoying the sport for what it is so for me that was good enough and I decided ah, I don't need this other summer job. So I left it there. Another part of it was being the Christian basketball camp. It, it was homophobic. And so when I came out, it was kind of like, well, I can't work here anymore and be who I am. Right. That's not something you're going to allow. And so if that's not possible, I can't continue on in good faith basically. That was the other part of like that made the leaving easy is just saying, you know, to the upper camp staff, like this is who I am. Clearly there's many queer people coming through your camp and either you can acknowledge we're here or you can kind of pretend we're not. And they decided on the pretend we're not, which is just too bad, but it, it made for an easy leaving for me. So you came out while you're in university? Yeah, yeah. Later in life, uh, Southern Alberta wasn't the easiest place to grow up queer, I guess you could say. Growing up, I, I didn't know anyone else like me. I didn't know the words for what I was feeling, what I was. The only role models, quote unquote, were people like Katie Lang. And I didn't understand why people hated Katie Lang so much other than she was queer and, and kind of masculine of center. And it probably had more to do with her stance on Alberta beef than it did on her queerness. But <laughs> you know, when you're in elementary school, you don't really understand those those little pieces of people's identities. So I, you know, didn't know anyone else that was queer until I was in junior high and a member of my congregation came out and it kind of destroyed their marriage. Oh, it came out as an adult? Yeah, I came out as an adult. So for part of my youth, that was also the other understanding of, oh, being queer means you're going to harm people or people aren't going to like you because that was, I think, again, more wrapped up in the end of a marriage and a relationship than understanding that it wasn't a good marriage. It wasn't a good relationship. It wasn't the right relationship for these individuals. Right. So at least I knew another person who was out, so to speak, in Lethbridge, and, and they were a prominent doctor. And so, you know, people didn't speak ill of them, but they also didn't speak well of them in the congregation anymore. So it did take me a number of years to kind of finding other individuals who were queer, and especially who were queer and Christian, to kind of get to that point of saying, oh, this is okay. And, and one of those individuals for me was a good friend named Tyson, who had been through kind of ex-gay ministries, and his parents had tried to help him change, and it just didn't work. And I I'd never been one to think I needed to change. It was more just when would it be safe or when would it be um, something that would be possible? So he really helped me see that, you know, there's a group of us who are trying to make this possible. And around that time in 2009 in Lethbridge, the first Pride Parade happened. So that was a, a great moment of just seeing a lot of supportive community. That it wasn't just the few of us on campus, that it wasn't just the few people I knew, but really a, a growing community of people that were trying to make it a safe or a better place. And so Levi and Ryan at Catwalk were a big part of that too, of, of being right. the presence and really trying to help make that possible, as well as McKillop United being one of the few churches, Christian churches in town to kind of say fairly early on, you know, we are an affirming congregation that welcomes LGBTQ peoples. And I was able to help with part of those conversations alongside Tyson to get them on that road. So it was a, a meaningful place and time in Lethbridge. I went looking back at it of, of a lot of social change and a lot of positive change that has continued on to today. Totally. That 
person who came out as an adult in your congregation, did they continue attending after everything happened? They attended uh, on and off. They ended up moving away, I think, to find a safer place. They were always welcome when they returned. But I think it was with that, like, there's certain things we don't talk about, or maybe don't bring your partner, which is kind of the understanding I came to assume too, even with my own church, when I was coming out, there's people who were glad for it. Uh, A few, I would say that were glad for it, that celebrated it. But mostly a lot of people were in like, deep mourning and sadness, which is something I didn't understand. I still don't fully understand to a degree. Just something that they didn't see as possible within their worldview, I guess, or the giftedness of that. Um, Luckily enough, though, (laughs) surprising as as the people of the congregation weren't supportive, a lot of the local pastors were. So my pastors at the time, the Anglican pastors in town, um, Aaron Phillips, especially at the U of L as a chaplain, was very supportive. Yeah. I did have a lot of people in my corner, so to speak, that once I started telling my truth, telling my story, really were very supportive in saying, you know, you're who you are made to be. There's nothing wrong with this, but that people are going to have an issue with it, not because of who you are, but because of where you are. It's just Southern Alberta. And so there was a lot of, of support in saying, you know, when you go somewhere else, you may have different experiences. There may be more opportunities. There's a reset in a way when you move. And so I appreciated that holding out of hope and them also so just uplifting that there's other paths forward. At the time, queer people, at least in that period of 2009 till 2011, weren't allowed yet to be pastors in the Lutheran church. You know, for me, it was a realizing of this is what I want to do. This is who I am, yet it's not allowed. So how do I continue on in that way? Right. A lot of conversations around, well, do you just hide who you are? And I kind of took one look in the mirror. I had had longer hair most of my life, but when I came out, I cut it off. I started dressing more masculinely, wearing bow ties. That was what I was happy in the world looking and being, dressing my gender, my personhood. You know, I kind of said, I can't hide this. Like if I show up like this to seminary, if I show up to this to do my master's, show up to church interviews, I'm not hiding my queerness. I've hid my queerness my whole life. This is just not something I'm willing to do. So at that point, I was kind of just waiting for the church to make a change or to kind of force the change myself. Um, And so in 2012, there was uh, a vote to change on the direction that the church had been taking to allow queer marriages to happen, to allow queer people to be fully involved in church life. Of course, they were in many cases, but they could be out and be welcome. And then also queer people could go to seminary uh, to become pastors. That's a master's degree. Uh, It sounds magical, masters of divinity. It sounds like I should join a D&D group. (laughs) <laughs> Master of the Divine, but that's what my my degree actually is, Masters of Divinity. So luckily for me, I was able to go to seminary that the laws, quote unquote, had changed, the rules had changed. There was nothing that said I couldn't go. However, there was many people who had gone through and hidden for many years. Right people that the seminary had protected, who they had said, just don't talk about your partners, just don't talk about your life. Like, we think you can do this work and someday the rules will change. So I was the first one who was out publicly. I also happened to be the only incoming student that year. Wow. There was no really hiding of who I was or where I was. I was the first year class. <laughs> How long had you been out, like graduated from the University of Lethbridge prior to 2012? Oh, just a year. Oh, okay. So it was just a year difference, which is why I'd stretched out my degree so long because I said, oh, I don't want to be out of academia for five years and then trying to get back into it. That worked out well in my favor. So it's just a year's difference. And was the support for the change? Was it like overwhelming support or was it like a narrow vote or? It, it got narrower and narrower. So the support for genuine, anyone can be a part of a congregation. If you're queer, you should be able to be welcomed. That was like 70 some percent. Marriage passed with, you know, 60 some percent. And then when it came down to should we ordain queer people, that passed with 50 some percent margin, like maybe 55 percent. So it slowly came down, came down, came down, but it passed. Okay. And it's something that had been brought for kind of 25 years to our decision body making conventions where people vote as lay people and pastors and bishops on the changes of the church. So it had been a long time in the process working towards this many people, allies and members of the queer community working for years to make this possible. So I felt like I showed up, I was there at that convention and just kind of freshly queer and kind of coming out in 2009, 2010 with really no stakes in the game and really just appreciating the work everyone had done to that point to allow me just to go to school to be who I was. For my master's to become a pastor, there were still a lot of people who were on edge 
about that decision, who didn't agree, right. and who are deciding whether or not they should stay with the form of Lutheran Church I'm a part of, which is the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada. There's a number of different branches of Lutheranism within Canada. Of so I'm sure the, the most liberal branch, so ELCIC. Yeah, I think the, the hardest part of navigating that process was simply just professors were always supportive. They were always teaching the best of their ability of, of why this isn't an issue, but it was more the students in the class. And them having to come face to face with a colleague who is going through seminary and whether or not they agreed with that. Similar to when women were allowed to become pastors, you know, some 50 years ago within my tradition. It was a change, but by and large, I had lots of support still. So I appreciated that. And you said that you were the first queer person to go through the program. Was that for that specific university or was it like across the country? Uh, across the country. So the first out nice. uh, queer person. Right. So there was plenty oh, sure, that came before me who... Of uh, course. There was, there was one who kind of started it all and said, I'm queer. And then they made the rule that you can't be queer and go to seminary. So, you know, there's been many who have been trying to tell their truth and, and come up against a systemic norm. And many who said, you know, I, I, I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do with my life. And how do I do it? And, you know, going through closeted and what does that look like? What does that do to someone? So a lot of my time now that I've been a pastor, I've kind of taken it up as to be part of my job to, to undo harm because I kind of had the free walks so to speak, into seminary, they had made space for me, they had made it safe within the organization as best they could to allow me to go and be out. So since then, I've been organizing as far as national level task forces on homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia, white supremacy, as well as racism, and then another one on ableism. So supporting these task forces work to say, you know, what is systemically wrong in the Lutheran Church in Canada in this way? You know, what ways have we harmed people? What apologies need to be made? What reparations need to be made? And that's kind of the strange part of working for a church is that, you know, it's a, it's a community, it's an organization, there's systemic parts, there's faith parts, there's colonial parts. And it's hard to kind of tease out where family ends and where faith ends and where systemic practices begin. And I think that's part of the work that I'm I'm called to do in the wider church. So something we recently took on was within the church, we'd rather be proactive than reactive. And so we named at our last convention that we wanted to begin study on consensual relationships and what that looks like, which is a conversation that, that should have happened long ago, of course, especially around ethical non-monogamy or polyamory. And what does that mean to welcome uh, everyone into church? Right. In families that quote unquote, may look different than what people are expecting. So instead of reacting in like a harmful way, how do we react in a way that says, how do I learn more? How do I have grace for others? How do I be more inclusive rather than just saying no to something you don't understand? So that's been part of my work or feeling called within a larger organization to say when things aren't right, aren't good, are systemic, kind of calling those out to even my national bishop or, or a national church at those levels. So, you know, I, I feel like I have a lot of privilege in the system now that they've kind of ordained me uh, and I'm a pastor. They can't take that away. And I, I am who I am. Um, and so I do appreciate being able to use those gifts in that way. Other than that, I'd consider myself more of a, a spiritual social worker than maybe most people would consider uh, a pastor. So living in Edmonton, Alberta, I serve a congregation called Holy Spirit Lutheran. We're one of the only ones in the city of the Lutheran denomination currently that are LGBTQIA plus inclusive welcoming and affirming. Uh, we say all are welcome, all means all. We really try to live that out. We don't do it perfectly, but we try. So a lot of learnings around that have been, where does this intersect with people's lives in my congregation? Where does this intersect in our community? We're really close to an LRT station and we have a lot of people coming through that are houseless. How do we meet their needs? Whether it's a simple, a bowl of food, conversation, recognizing that you are human. <laughs> you know, people look down on, on houseless people for most of their lives when they're out in community. And they become visible when they come in to see us. They have a conversation. We can check in with them. How are they doing? You know, those things are meaningful. Also, a lot of members of our congregation have been drawn here because they and their families have felt othered for one reason or another. Mom Stop the Harm is another group that was founded by one of uh, our members when she lost oh. her her queer son to uh, a fentanyl overdose in 2015. So just as we were beginning to hear the dangers of fentanyl and what it was, her son had had died of an overdose of it without realizing it. Some uh, substances he was taking were laced with fentanyl and he just right. didn't. So she began this organization with a lot of other mothers, parents, caregivers of those who use substances to say harm reduction is key. So regularly we have people like her, you know, giving these messages in our church. Is that Petra? Yeah, Petra. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. 
Cool. You know, there's lots of, of people with similar mindsets to that as well as, as environmental stewardship. We're really a place that I, I feel, you know, it is faith-based, but, you know, we, we have a lot of organization, I guess, that feels to me like organization for social good, organization for community good, that it's not, you have to subscribe to our beliefs, that you have to come to church Sunday, but do you want to join a community that's doing something for the world? that's trying to make it a better place in one way or another. So, you know, the other spot I enjoy being is on the, the front steps of the, the legislature. And I've, I've been there leading protests for anti-hate rallies. We had an issue with white supremacists before the pandemic happened in in 2019, there was a lot of violence against Muslim communities and especially Muslim women. Um, so it was kind of a, a privileged point for me to be able to take part in that. A lot of work around gay straight alliances and a lot of the protests that were happening to say to the government, kids should be allowed to have safety in schools to be who they are. They shouldn't be outed to their parents or their caregivers just to receive support and care. So there's always something going on in Edmonton politically. There's always some um, gathering you can join in or, or join your work to. So I also appreciate that within within where I'm serving right now. Cool. And where did you go to school for your ministry training? It was attached to the U of S and it was called the Lutheran Theological Seminary. Since that time and COVID and all that, they've moved fully online. They've actually joined as well with the Saskatoon Theological Union. So there's a United Church Seminary there, an Anglican Church Seminary there, and a Lutheran Church Seminary there. Oh, wow can share their classes and courses and um, partake in the various offerings. So it's a pretty cool place. I had options to go, you know, whether it was in the prairies out in Ontario, there's another school or stateside, but I thought, you know, let's just stay close to home. Canadian context is important. And it's been great to, to also have colleagues, I would say, has been the number one learning of, you know, seminary for me, like any degree, it really gives you a tool belt of what you know, and largely what you know you need to learn. Having colleagues locally, and abroad, who I went to school with, who I can bounce ideas off of, who I can say, this is what's going on. What do you think I should do of all different ages has been super important to thriving and surviving and in ministry as a pastor for myself. Cool. And when did you graduate from there? 2016. Yeah. So, so a four-year master's. Yeah. Oh, okay. And did, that was the end of your educational journey? O officially over. Lots of, uh, lots of opportunity to do more. There's uh, every year I have an education fund that I can go do courses. I just took with the Canadian Council of, of Churches Engaging Difference, which is an intercultural live-in program for five days where you're learning about others' cultures and your interactions with those cultures and and things like power and privilege and dominance and whiteness and colonialism. So, you know, I continue to live into these things, but more on the short form than long form. I'm not someone who bless academics. I don't consider myself one. I'm more on the ground type of person that needs that and support. So my wife, bless her, is one of those academics who has the giftings for that. And uh, the thought of having to write another 40 page paper, you know, gives me sweaty palms. So I'd rather not. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to have the education. I feel blessed to have the education I have. Like I said, Masters of Divinity, if I show up to like a D&D &D game, I feel like I have an automatic in with any character using magic. Yeah, that's about the extent of my wish to continue on in a formal education. Was Holy Spirit the first place you got a job after you finished your ministry school? In seminary, there's kind of two years of learning um, that are courses based. And then you kind of have two years where you're on internship. And then you're also still taking some courses while you're there. So it's kind of more in a setting where you can learn about those aspects of your job. So you're doing more knowledge the first years and then the last two years you're doing more in community learning so I actually did my learning here at Holy Spirit so I was an intern here for two years and a large part of that was it was the only church I could be at being out and open and queer right and so when it came time to look for a job, the congregation kind of discerned along with the bishop and myself, you know, this is a spot that I could be. And so they hired me on and I've been here ever since. So we'll we'll see what that looks like into the future. But I'm certainly glad to be serving here of kind of that length of time. It's, you know, 2014, it's coming up to almost 10 years of being here, you know, not fully as a pastor all those time, but working with community. So it's been a blessing to say the least. Yeah. That's going to be a big milestone for you next year. Looking forward to some celebrating and all that comes with it. Yeah. Cool. And so now you are where you are. Now I am where I am trying to do what I can with the, the little bit of privilege I have here, there and elsewhere to make the world a better place. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us. A couple of questions. So what did your parents do for work while you were growing up? 
My mom worked a long time in Woodward slash Safeway Bakery. That was her her job that I knew growing up. Um, she was on strike. I remember one time when I was I was younger, so I kind of learned about the importance of we don't cross picket lines, or at what point does your family have to if there's no other job? And what does that look like for friendships? What does that look like? And that was kind of through the lens of an elementary school child's eyes. My mom and dad never really fully explained things other than I joined my mom on the picket line. I didn't know really what I was doing, but her friends were out there and I was out there with her. So that's what I recall there. But my mom worked at Safeways for her whole career. I'm outside of that. So it was also kind of that public facing physical labor uh, bakery work. And then my dad was trained in electronics at Lethbridge College and worked at Novatel for many years until that went out of business. Basically, Canada lost out in the cell phone world. So it all went stateside to California. And then even California lost out and it all went overseas to China and Japan. Um, so he was kind of forced out of that market and out of that phase of his education. Then he worked at Southland Trailers for a while and kind of computing and scheduling. And then he went back to um, actually one of the first jobs he was ever offered as a, as a bus driver. So he drove bus for the last several years of his life. Oh. City of Lethbridge really enjoyed that work. Still something he considers doing. He's he's 70 now, so it's not something he needs to be doing. But, you know, he's always thought, I could drive school bus. Yeah. So he had a really good group of, of bus drivers he was working with and enjoyed the work as much as one can. And Novotel, that was in the location where Miracle Channel is now, right? Yeah, that was the whole Novotel building. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember that closure. Yeah, it was something else to have that in Lethbridge. So. Yeah, I remember that closure. Huh. Interesting. Did you have siblings? Yeah, I have a younger sibling, uh, Michelle, a few years younger than me, and she works in uh, Calgary. For a long time, she's been working with kids on the spectrum Okay. before they head into the school system and as they're just beginning the school system. So implementing programs of aid, whether that's through therapists or through others, that speech, things that need to happen for their bodies. And the unfortunate thing is she used to have great funding. <laughs> From the government. So she used to have maybe four students who needed intentional care that she would go in their homes, meet with families and all that stuff and help them transition from kind of age three to age five into school and into daycare environments. Unfortunately, with the, the funding cuts this last year, she was up to 27 students. If you do the math, if you're used wow. to having four intentionally, 27, you can't really give that range of care for. Even if there's multiples in one visit, it's just not the same. So it's something that, you know, she's feeling forced out of, even though it's something she's very good at, the burnout rate has increased exponentially for her and for many within that kind of system. So she's looking at further education to say, you know, I still care about this area, but I can't do this for the rest of my life as it stands, because it's it's a burnout waiting to happen. Yeah, no doubt. And it was just the two of you then growing yeah. up? Yeah. Okay. And you said you're married. So what does your wife do? Yeah, so my wife is at the U of A. She's a, a PhD candidate in uh, poli sci. She is delightful, lovely, well-learned. She did her first degree at the U of L in, in women's studies and gender studies, continued with a master's at the U of A in, in women and gender studies, and then is doing her PhD in, in poli sci and really interested in climate crisis, um, really interested in Anthropocene work, really interested in different ways of viewing the, the world through computing lenses how AI is coming into to being. So lots of interest that she has in different areas um, and what she's going to do in the world. And we have a, a little one who's just two, Georgia. So she keeps us really busy. <laughs> you said she's two? Two, yes. Just okay, two. Cool. Yeah. It's a great age. Just exploring things. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we just learned about pretending. So we have a lot of games we play that are pretend games these days. So that's just fun to see her figuring out the world. That's adorable. That's awesome. So I ask you a question that I ask all my guests, and I think you kind of touched on this, but there might be some more that you want to share. How has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experiences as a worker? And that could be gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, economic class, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think in many ways, I'm a fairly, fairly privileged individual being a settler, uh, being white, uh, masculine of center, how I present these days. Um, my queerness, you know, at times when I was working did come into play in a way that that made me feel unsafe in some environments, but by and large, the rest of my privileges outweighed that, that I could advocate for myself. And my, my faith background being Christian also often played in my favor in many backgrounds that I had Christian bosses or were in Christian organizations, really the centered dominance of power. So 
you know, I'd say the only times I really experienced it was um, ageism, perhaps, um, in my first job of people just assuming, oh, these young kids won't realize we're cutting off on the top of their pay and padding our own wages. Or within the church that I now serve, you know, I'm seen as a young person still. I'm approaching 40, but still I'm very young, <laughs> which, you know, can be seen as a good thing, but also it can be hard when you're like, well, actually I'm... <laughs> I may be a millennial, but I'm heading middle age-ish. So, you know, those are some of the battles I continue to, to go back and forth on. A lot of churches still haven't done the work to become fully inclusive. So within my current working trajectory, that's something I'm, I'm working on is trying to help colleagues bring other churches along to say we need to have more affirming places that people can land or that I myself can work that can serve in community and safe ways. So people need to be doing that work on the ground as much as I try to do the work. Sometimes the queer voice and queer face coming into a community isn't always the safest one to do that work. And so really calling on my cis het colleagues to, to begin conversations or to invite me in as an ally to begin some conversations to do that work. So that's where I kind of see the intersections playing out. Yeah. And on, just on that last point here, so it does seem like a lot of the times queer people have to, well, not just queer people, but marginalized people in general, the ones who have to take on all the work and shoulder all the burdens. And you can see why so many people, you know, give up because it's just, it, it, it's just so dra draining a lot of the time. L luckily, you know, the other side, it can be life-giving and I have enough privilege That's... to make me say, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm still here. <laughs> so yeah. um, you're not getting rid of me that easy. <laughs> I just try to care bear stare my way through it, I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. Any final thoughts you have for our listeners? I'm just thankful for this chance to talk, Kim, and, and for all your work you continue to do in Lethbridge. I know you're a, a force for inclusion and uh, support for so many, and, and I sure appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate that as well. If people are interested in, you know, following you online, is there anywhere they could go? You know, public socials, blog, website, whatever. Find me at my current place of work, holyspiritlutheran.ca. Um, on Instagram, I'm at skakes, S-K-A-K-E-S. -K -E and on Facebook, you can find me, uh, Lindsay Jorgensen Skakem. Great. And I'll be sure to include that in the show notes. Uh, if the people want to follow The Alberta Worker, you can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, or some people call it X now, and LinkedIn. And you can visit us online on our website, albertaworker.ca. Where And when you're there, you can sign up for our email newsletter. We have a daily, weekly, and monthly options where we just summarize the most recent news that we've published. If you liked this podcast episode, please rate us and leave a review in your favorite podcast app. It helps people to become aware of our podcast. If you want to support the Alberta Worker, you can do that at our website as well, albertaworker.ca slash support. The Alberta Worker, as well as this podcast, depend on the support of listeners just like you. If you're interested in being a guest, drop us an email at podcast at albertaworker.ca or just send us a DM on one of our social media accounts. Thank you very much, Lindsay, for joining us today. Thank you all the listeners for joining us today as well. And as always, solidarity. Solidarity.